Assalamu alaikum once again and welcome to The Traveller's Prayer, the podcast that aims to explore the behind the scenes tales of some of the most notable Islamic events and the man behind some of these events, Rehan Iqbal. Say hello. Assalamu alaikum Ahmed, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good bro. Okay. He will go through his stories of trials and tribulations when organizing Islamic events and last week we explored the origins of Like Media TV, his first uh, event organization uh, where he organized his first ever tour. Now that's what I call Islam, which was hosted by Sheikh Jamaluddin Haysa and how he saved the soul from going to a cl- nightclub that one lecture evening. But yeah, uh, th- that's what we explored last week. And this week we explore his second tour, which was called Five Upon Five Before Five, uh, which explored the famous hadith by the Prophet Sallallahu where, y- you know, uh, rough little... Uh, background to that is is take care of your youth before you reach old age take care of your heart before take care of your health before you reach sickness and so on sort of highlighting the urgency to make the most of the things you have before it's gone and this tour was hosted by Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya a Vietnamese American scholar who was well known for being an instructor at Al Maghrib Institute uh, let's just first get into that and how you connected with him in your second tour so the second tour after the first one kind of concluded i wanted to move away from the idea or a set idea that someone might have yeah that we're an organization with one ideology Mm. in terms of islamic philosophy back in 2009 When I was first around, a lot of organizations that were putting on large-scale tours and events usually had a Islamic viewpoint and perspective Mm. that they would emphasize and elaborate on in their events. So you'd have, for example, an organization that was very Sufi inclined. Mm. So all the speakers would be Sufi inclined speakers. You'd have an organization that was more Salafi inclined. So they would bring all Salafi related speakers. An organization that was more Ikhwani focused would bring Ikhwani speakers and so on and so Mm. forth. A lot of the work I'd done previously was very non-sectarian because working through so many different ISOCs, I understood that different ISOCs, Mm. different individuals had different perspectives and viewpoints on Islam. And I didn't want to be that guy who walked in and said, this is the only version of Islam that we want to, yeah. to discuss. I also wasn't very much into that whole sectarian divide. I thought with all the issues and problems that we have as a British Muslim community, yeah. standing there and saying my Islamic perspective and viewpoint, especially as university students who are 21, 22, 23, maybe if you're in a mosque environment and amongst learned scholars, they can debate and discuss these mm. issues. I just thought university just was not that space for that. Yeah, and you can potentially take away a lot of benefits if you don't, if you make it sectarian. Because there's people that could probably not benefit from it if you just angled it towards a certain group of people. Yeah, and that happened in very many ISOCs. Yeah. Very many ISOCs you'd see would push that angle to the detriment of everything else. Yeah. Almost as if that was the single element, the single focus of the Islamic society. Forget yeah. about the fact that we have so many Muslims just now not paying attention to the Islamic society because they knew that you were very rigid in your philosophy and viewpoint and you only wanted to push a certain agenda. Mm. I just didn't see any benefit in that. I was someone who spent time with scholars from multiple different backgrounds mm. and there's good in every single one. You know, you, you, if you want to analyze and dissect every single group, I'm sure you can find issues that people differ on and people don't agree with necessarily but by and large especially with topics and discussions that you have at university level Mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to get that deep and so for me i always wanted to steer clear from that i wanted people to know that my message was more of a case of trying to bring people together and as long as it was a good, healthy, positive message that the person was saying, mm. the, the speaker or artist or performer, whatever whatever they were, as long as what they were doing was positive and what they were doing was in line with the issues that university students would have, yeah. that was what I was very much interested in. The rest of it I, around this speaker is like this and that speaker is like that. 
I just really wasn't interested in because I, I just thought it was a waste of time. So I knew when I did that my first tour that very many people who knew the background of that speaker would instantly attach or would try to attach a Sufi inclined spin on the organization. Yeah. So people, if, especially if they don't know you, they'll look for markers and indicators to try to understand who you are, especially in the Islamic practicing scene. They, mm. People are really intrigued by what you believe, with, which mosque you go to, which yeah. scholars you follow. So I thought, okay, if I've got the first one there with a Sufi based speaker, with what I believe and, and what I was trying to do, I wanted to bring in someone who was different to that. So again, trying to bring the speaker in, I wanted to send a message almost. Mm. The first tour that we did, the messaging was very much where we're colorful, we're going to talk about stuff that has been off the table a lot of the times and we're going to try to be very much a um, youth-focused organization. The message with this one was trying to be a little bit along the lines of don't put us in a sectarian box. We'll bring speakers who benefit mm. young people and we'll put on events that doesn't matter the background of the speaker, doesn't matter who they are, what they are, what they believe, as long as it's universally the, the issue that we're discussing and debating yeah. or, or talking about, as long as it's universally accepted by everyone, then that's what we're going to do. So I reached out to Al Maghrib Institute knowing that they have a slightly different crowd um, than the crowd that would have known Sheikh Jamal al-Din Haisal. Mm. And I wanted to bring a speaker from that side of the the, the equation. Um, and so that's where the discussion around Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya kind of started. So the al Maghrib Institute guys, when I reached out to them and said, I'm looking to bring a speaker to do a, an event. Can you see who might be available? around this time period, they said, Abdul Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya is, is one of the speakers who's available. And to mm. me, I watched a couple of his lectures online. I knew of him already. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. Let's, let's you know, bring him down with us. Okay. Um, so it's the reputation that more brought you to him. But which side did you say that he leaned more towards? Because your first event had a more Sufi uh, leaning. Which side would he lean to more? He probably himself would be the best person to say he leans, you know, towards this way or that way. Mm. Al Maghrib Institute probably has more of a Salafi um, okay. orientation. Yeah, you know, whether that's stuff that the speakers themselves say that they're inclined to, or whether that's the groups and organization that they yeah. align themselves with at that time. Still, probably today, and the masjids that they visit, mm. it was it's very clear that they're more Salafi leaning, which is which is which is fine by me. And so I, I knew that if I brought an Al Maghrib Institute speaker on tour, then to those people who want to put me in a box, it yeah. might confuse them a little bit. And that wasn't the okay, only yeah. that wasn't the only reason why why I, I I did it. It wasn't just okay. I just want to throw people off. Mm. There's benefits in every single group. Exactly. And it's a case of not wanting to. And and I think we were speaking about this before we we got on the on the mics was. You know, we speak a lot about a lot of concepts when mm. we discuss these tours in the past. We might talk about branding. We might talk about creativity. We might talk about reaching out to young people. We might talk about doing something different. Mm. All these different elements that we, we discuss ultimately. And the one thing that we probably don't mention as much as we some people might want us to is the fact that everything that we do is lined up with good deeds. Mm. So everything that I start off with, I think, okay, how can I reach more people to gain as many good deeds as possible? Mm. And all these little lines and all these little um, strings to the bow that come along with that, when we talk about the creativity and branding and trying to get a message out to young people and all these things, these are just the subsets of trying to gain good deeds. Yeah. So if I've done a program with a Sufi speaker to Islamic societies who are more inclined to that way of thinking, mm. If I just focus on that one particular group, I'm restricting my good deeds. Whereas if I say, okay, well, they have a, a worldview of a different perspective and they yeah. listen to different types of speakers. Yeah. 
And the speakers that they listen to Generally I think they have Very good positive message Yeah I'll invite them Because then I'm opening the door To more good deeds Because I'm reaching more people Rather than just saying Okay I'm going to restrict myself To the You know A handful of ISOCs yeah. Who If you follow this This one particular speaker I'm just going to bring speakers Of you know, that persuasion I'm restricting the The number of good deeds Potentially So everything that we We talk about And we start about And we elaborate a little bit more When we talk about The elaboration on, on the podcast that is really the second and third tier stuff. The first mm-hmm. tier is, and the initial thinking is, how can we get, how can we gain more good deeds? How can we reach more people? What are the different avenues? And then it starts to splinter off into how we how we do that. Okay, that's good. That's a more pragmatic approach instead of just sticking with your own kinfolk. Um, yeah, the interesting part of this as well was the spelling, because uh, whichever tour that you go on to, you try to add a little bit of flavor into it. So the uh, poster said five before five, but the initial five was in letters and the other five was just the, let- the number five. Why was that? To be honest with you, that was more of a visual thing yeah. than anything else. So when we sat down, me and my friend who made the poster for the first tour, mm. we start to think about ideas and concepts and how we portray this idea. Mm. And because it's always something before something, so it's youth before old age, health before sickness, free time before preoccupation, all that, all that kind of stuff. Because of that, he created a poster with a line down the middle. Mm. And said, if we have certain references before the line, which represents the first part of the equation, and we have the second part of the poster, which will reference the second part. Mm. And the second part generally is the negative part. Yeah. So life is a positive part. Death is a negative part. Free time is a positive part. Preoccupation is the, the negative part. Wealth is the positive. Poverty is the negative so the poster, if you ever go back and look at it, the left-hand side is is a light color. Mm. I think it's it's white, and um, or, or gray or silver, something like that. And then the right-hand side is is a darker color. It's a black. And the idea was to almost try to mimic that through a visual thing. So that was how we tried to do the individual topics. Yeah. But when it came to the theme itself, because it's five before five, we thought about things like symmetry. Shall we put the number five back to back? So it says five before five. That didn't really work. Shall we just put five before five just written? Well, then how does that work in a positive and negative kind of flow? So we thought, okay, you can you can say it in, in letters and you can say it in a number. Generally speaking, the number version, because it's a short form version, it's almost mm. like the lazier version of yeah. if you ever want to write it. It's like when you were in school. Teachers would always tell you, write the let you know, write the word rather than just put the net number. Yeah. So if you were going to write forty five, they wouldn't like it when you were in school. If you wrote just the numbers forty five, they would say mm. write forty dash five. So I said to the the poster guy that if we take that same element and we say, okay, spelling the word is better than just writing the number. Mm. Shall we put that on the poster? And make it look like that. So it was just, and that's very deep. I don't think anyone, aside from me and the poster guy, got that. So I, I very highly doubt that anyone who's ever seen the poster or reflects on it thinks it's that deep. Uh, but that was meant to be the the thought process and the concept. It came from a visual point of view. Um, but I think what that shows a lot of the times is, you know, for anyone who's an event organizer, anyone who looks at these events or goes attends an event and you'll see a quirk somewhere mm. like that's a slight quirk we could have written five before five or just put the number five and five twice but usually when someone does something like that there's a logic and a, a, a perceived rationale behind it and that was our rationale so mm. if you ever see a poster where you see something slightly different it might be cool to just go up and you don't get it or you you know flies right past you approach the person behind it and just say look why did you do that? And when they explain it to you, you might be like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool or interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting backstory to it. Yeah. Uh, let's try deconstructing how the events, the lecture series went through. Uh, it was five events, uh, which covered each 
part of the hadith uh, from, you know, the five pieces of rice from the Prophet but it was over four days. Uh, it wasn't like your first tour. Uh, it was more traditional Islamic one as opposed to the unconventional, creative and different one that you did for your first one, which is now that's what I call Islam. Uh, what was the reason for that? You want to take a sort of back step? Did you try not to ruffle a few feathers like last time or you do you, you wanted more people to come through this time? This was more around, again, I didn't want anyone to put us in a box. Yeah. So I didn't want it to feel as if or come across as if we're just an organization that is, in, you know, just doing creativity for the sake of being creative. Yeah. Nowadays, there's a lot less of a negative perspective on creativity and art. Mm. Then it was a bit more along the lines of there was a perceived perception, or there could be a perceived perception that you're just doing funky, funny stuff just for the sake of it. You know, yeah. you just want to be ultra creative for no reason. There's no meaning. There's no meaning behind it. It's just very airy fairy, and you're just trying to create an impact. So. The idea was to say, you know, this is a serious project. We are mm. trying to do certain things slightly differently. But at the same time, we are rooted in, Isla in, in Islamic faith and trying to get Islamic messaging and mm. principles over to the people that we're trying to attract and, and um, influence and speak to. And also, secondary to that as well, was it fell in the time where it's Islam Awareness Week. Yeah. So I knew if we're going to approach Islamic societies and organizations and say, we want to invite a speaker at this time, everyone's thought process and mindset would be, okay, so how does it fit in our Islam Awareness Week? How does yeah. it fit in our Discover Islam Week? So okay that you, it's okay that you want to do it, but this is a very significant part of the academic year for us. Mm -hmm. Your priorities cannot supersede our priorities. They have to go hand in hand. So how do we balance those two things out? And if I thought at that time, along the lines of not wanting every single thing to be, because if you have every single thing as well being creative, yeah. all of a sudden there's no impact to the creativity. That's true. Because the creativity, being too creative, stops the creativity because people just are like, oh, that's just another thing that they yeah. do. It doesn't feel different because you're always different. Mm. If that Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it's not novel anymore. Because you keep trying to do something novel. Exactly. Yeah. So that was uh, that was one of the things. And I also didn't want to go into Islamic societies and say, we have this amazingly different new thing. Mm. And again, the mindset of 2009, they could very easily have turned around and said, this is too different. Mm. We're just trying to get people in to help them learn about Islam. Mm. So that was a logic and thought process behind doing something slightly more traditional. Okay. So you try, you took a back step because you want to make it more palatable and also link up with the uh, Islam Awareness Week. I mean, it's very difficult to say it was a back step. It was a side step. Not back. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just to make it more, I don't know, like it's it's easier to digest, especially with the events coming up. Yeah. And it's, it's presumably a lot easier to push uh, your event to them if it was, if you explain it in less words. Yeah, and also it's it's that thing of priorities again. Yeah. Who's if you remember last week when we talked about Cambridge University and we said the the audience was people were sitting wherever they, they yeah. want to, it's very difficult to go into a, a group of people and say, I know you want to do this, but actually I think and I know that this way is better. Yeah. This different thing that I want to do is better. It's, you can do it once or twice, but you can't do an entire tour mm. based on that way you're you're fighting with people. So I had to marry up and almost portray it, especially because Discover Islam Week is such an important time. Yeah, you almost portray it like it's it's more important to you know we're here just to serve Islamic societies. Mm. That's why there's never an obligation if we approach someone and say do this event. There's never an obligation for someone to say yes, I'll do it. We're here to serve. And mm. so we have to know the thought process and the outputs of what people want to be served with rather than yeah. just turn up and we're serving you this, so so take it. Okay. That seems that makes sense. Instead of uh because also in the, your previous events you always had to convince them 
of why it was a good idea to host that event. But I assume with this one, it was a lot easier to sort of push the idea and for them to accept it. Yeah, because Islam Awareness Week time. Yeah. People are always looking for speakers and scholars and sessions of knowledge. Mm. So it's not too difficult throughout the other times of the year. It's more of a convenience. Mm. But in February, when it's the summer awareness week time, people almost reliant on organizations bringing them with speakers. Yeah. So it's far easier at this time of the year to do that than, you know, the, the October thing that we did earlier. Yeah. So. Okay, that makes sense. And then we move on to the first event of the tour called Youth Before Old Age, which was held at Green Lane Mosque in Birmingham. Uh, it was a youth orientated event, but you didn't do it at a university. You decided to have a mosque. Why? Very interestingly, one of the things that happens when you're liaising with a speaker yeah. is you try to book and align the stars so that a speaker can come in on a certain day. Mm. But what tends to happen is maybe it's priorities with their local masjid mm. or they've got another event somewhere or there's something with their family that they need to take care of and, and, and be there for. So you have to change the dates. And that's what happened here. So originally we'd asked if Sheikh Abdubari can come between Monday and Friday, mm. which would have sit in you know, very nicely with our Islam Awareness Week plan. Yeah. Once we went through the logistics of speaking to him and, and working out the dates, mm. the request came back. Actually, we can only do the Sunday through to the Wednesday. He had yeah. to be at a course, I believe, straight after the event. And, you know, he was tied up back home before. So we had to take the Sunday to the the Wednesday, which was okay with me, but the you know, because I really wanted to host him and it was a good time of the year to do yeah. that. The issue is that universities are not open on Sundays. Yeah. So if a university is not open, you've got two choices: don't do an event at all, and have an additional rest day. So I'll give the speaker two rest days, because this time Sheikh Abdubari came in, you know, on the the Saturday. So give him the Saturday as a rest day and the Sunday as a rest day and get ready for the Monday. Yeah. Or do it in a third space, not a Islamic society. Do it in a, in a different space. Mm. And Green Lane Mosque is one of the best organized and responsible masjids in the yeah. UK when it comes to events and event planning. So I had full trust in confidence in them that if I approached them with this idea not only would they do it but they'd be able to do it to a really high standard and really yeah, well I get that get a really good crowd in for that so they also do a lot of work with young people mm. so it wasn't too much of a stretch to go to Green Lane and yeah. say you know this is this is the topic we want to get younger people in can you guys bring that younger crowd in and to ensure that the sheikh is not speaking to you know a bunch of old uncles about yeah. youth before old age. So that was very easy, although it did go a little bit against the grain in regards to what we were trying to do. Mm. Again, like I mentioned before, everything we do was in, in previous pod podcasts is everything we do was recorded anyway. So okay. once we've recorded it, anyone who's watching it on the internet, whether they're a university student, whether they're a college student, whether they're a, they're a older gentlemen it doesn't really matter they're absorbing the same content to them it doesn't matter where it was shot and recorded to them all that matters is being able to watch that video back and benefit from it yeah so we got the the event done and recorded and we put it online and you know there wasn't a need necessarily for people to stand there and say oh that wasn't in a university that was in a mosque so you know we can we can bend the rules every once in yeah. a while Okay. What was the turnout uh, for the youth? What year was this, by the way? 2010. 2010. Okay. Um, so it was four months after the first tour. Yeah. Four, uh, yeah. I, I forgot to mention that it was four months on. But uh, I assume Green Lane had a big turnout or with the youth back then. I'm not sure about now, but I, I just remember in my years in college and, and uni, there was a lot of people my age that was going to Green Lane at that time. 
Yeah, yeah Green Lane's always had a reputation of, especially when it's their own conferences. Yeah. They have a winter and summer conference where loads of people turn up. And they'll also put on sporadic events. They've gotten more professional in recent years. Mm. So now when you go to their stuff, it's mega well attended. Mm. People who don't even live in the same area will flock out to the, the mm. mosque to to pray and, and listen to some of the speeches that are going on. Then a little bit less so. They weren't as professionally aligned as they are now. Mm. However, it was still far better than most you know mosque attendances would have been. And they had a very healthy young contingent there. Okay. So whenever you're liaising with a host of any kind, whether mm. it's a university or, or, or a mosque, you have a back and forth in regards to what you're hoping will be the outcome of the event. And of course, when we go in with a topic like Youth Before Old Age, mm. and we were discussing with the, the mosque execs, they were very much well aware that we were hoping and expecting there to be young people in the crowd because it would be really weird to have a lecture talking about youth to older gentlemen. So they did a very good job with, you know, it wasn't like four or 500 people. But it was a good, you know, couple of hundred people in attendance there scattered around. So we were happy with that. I just imagine <clears throat> there's like an old six-year-old man on a chair. Just, he feels like, the, the speech is directly for him. Like I got another 30 years left. Like, <laughs> I need to take advantage of this. Yeah. That's a positive outcome. But yeah, moving on to the uh, event after that, Health Before Sickness. Uh, that was a second event. Uh, and at that tour, it supposedly was supposed to be held at Coventry University. But it was held in War Warwick. What happened there? So anyone who's seen the poster... You'll see on there that it's, it's, I think even to this day, it still says Coventry University on there. And we ended up, like you said, at Warwick University. It was very interesting how that ran about. When we were talking earlier about booking a speaker yeah. and dates changing, this was a consequence of dates changing. Oh. So originally, we were going to Warwick University on this second date which was meant to be the first date. Yeah. So this was meant to be youth before old age at Coventry University. Mm. Once we had to change the dates, I had a phone call. So Coventry University on board with it. It's about mm. youth before old age. They were having a summer awareness week, fit in perfectly with everything that they wanted. Mm. Great, let's do this. Once the dates changed, I went back to the president to inform him that the dates changed. And with hindsight now, he, when I recall the conversation on the phone, he went, oh, so when I told him we have to change the, we've changed the date. And because it was a second, because it was based on the Hadith, yeah. we couldn't just say, okay, what we'll do is we'll put, you know, the first lecture first and the second lecture, sorry, the second lecture first and the first lecture second. It wouldn't make sense to, you know, all of a sudden say, okay, health before sickness was going to go first and youth before old age was going to go second. It had to be in chronological order of yeah. the hadith. That was the plan anyway. So because they'd been bumped from the first position into the second position, looking back now, it proved to be a problem to them. Mm. He didn't say that to me on the phone call when I informed him that they're no longer going to have the same speech. That was probably, I think, five weeks before the tour that mm. me and him had that conversation. Promotional material has gone out. The following week. So we'd always promote four weeks in advance. Mm. Material's gone out. Their name's on there. About a week and a half to go. I phoned him up. Just chewing the fat about the specifics. You know, what's going to happen? What time do you want us to get there? What's the plan afterwards? Mm. How's the promotion going? How many people do you think are going to turn up? And he says, oh, I'm really sorry. I forgot to mention it to you. But we don't want to have the event anymore. So no. this is like a week and a half. We've been telling people it's going to be at Coventry University. And I remember I was driving when we had this conversation. I had him on loudspeaker, for any cops listening. Mm. <laughs> I had him on loudspeaker. I said, look, what were you talking about? You don't want the event anymore. Yeah, the original title was really good. But now that you've changed the topic, it doesn't really fit in with our Islam Awareness yeah. Week. So we don't want the event anymore. Me, now I'm starting to get really wound up about this along the lines of, well, how long have you guys had no, this plan exactly. for that you didn't want to have the event? 
oh, literally as soon as you had that phone call conversation with me, I spoke to the team, we decided there and then. Well, that was two weeks ago. Why didn't you tell me two weeks ago? Well, I didn't know how to tell you. But now we've told everyone <laughs> that it's going to happen at your thing. Yeah. And I said, imagine if the shoe was on the other foot. Mm. Imagine if with a week and a half to go, I had said to you, sorry, bro, I decided there's another Islamic site that I want to go to because mm. they'll have a bigger attendance than you. So I'm not going to come to your university, despite the fact that you've attended. He was very sympathetic to it. Oh, yeah, that's happened to us before. <laughs> so how did that feel when that happened to you? Yeah, it was very frustrating and really annoying. And, you know, some of these times when these speakers and you know these organizations cancel, it's really annoying. Yeah. And there's me like really getting wound up yeah. on the other side going, you're missing the irony. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going on. So like I'm laughing right now. Then I was really getting wound up because my thought was, like, how am I supposed to replace an Islamic society? Yeah. And it's it was a week and a half. But once you take out the weekends, yeah. you're talking... You know, a week. Yeah. So it was probably the week, the Tuesday before the tour. So I was just in a real quandary. He just was like, "Well, it's our decision. It's our Islam. It's our Discover Islam week. We're allowed to pick and choose the topics, and we're allowed to invite the speakers. And you know, looking back on it now, you can't apportion blame on either you know me or yeah. him. It's very easy laughing but, about it. But that interaction highlights how young the young how young people you're dealing with are and and how like there's no because from your end there's a lot of professionalism you have to do with the sheikh you have to do with organizers on other ends and you have to like you know like tie up a lot of loose ends but on their end it's just like we're just a bunch of university students trying to do something cool and you know we we send we don't even send emails we might send a te like there's there's no structure there to be had and you have to always like <laughs> make sure that they understand where you come from but you also have to understand okay this is fickle young people you're dealing with all the time it's <laughs> a nice way to put it yeah um yes yeah, there is that and also you know if anyone is ever listening to this if you ever are liaising with an external organization yeah you, they like myself would appreciate it far more if after that first phone call if you had phoned me back that mm -hmm. day or the next day, whenever they'd had their internal discussion to say, thank you for the kind offer. Just the deliverables that you initially said you would help us with yeah. in the Islamic events is not going to be there now. Yeah. With the new information that we have, it doesn't really work for us. Mm. So thank you, but no thank you. We'd rather do something else. Mm. Of course, there'd be a little bit of frustration at the beginning, but that would be minor compared to having to replace you know, the entire event location with a week to go. Yeah. So anyone who ever feels upset or isn't fully comfortable with what an external organization is presenting you with. Yeah. Trust me, they will very much more appreciate it if you're just honest and open with yeah. them from the beginning rather than hold it inside to the very last second because then the other person doesn't have time to react. Mm. And that's kind of what happened. So Coventry is very close to Warwick. They're both in the Coventry area. Mm. Um, they both have CV postcodes. So I reached out to Warwick, who I had done work with previously. I did a tour before Like Media. The very last tour before Like Media was with Sheikh uh, Yahya Ibrahim. Mm. And I took him to Warwick University. So I knew the team there and I explained the situation. I said, this is what's happened. This is the situation. There's no cost on you guys. Can you just help me out by fitting this slot in mm. with a week's notice? It wasn't even the Islam Awareness Week time. They just said, yeah, fine. We'll book the room. We'll fill out the forms. Come down and you can record it. So we did that. And of course, we didn't get as many attendances as we were hoping for. But with a week's notice, yeah. we were really pleased with, with what we had. Um, so that was the story of that particular event. Okay. What What would you do if you couldn't find a place? Would you just put uh, the sheikh on a soapbox in a square somewhere and then have him talk and then just bring in random people from the streets? Listen, guys, <laughs> <laughs> we've got something for you here. Yeah. yeah. I would have found a way. I was a lot younger then. Yeah. So I had a lot more get up and go about me. 
it was ne- it never came across my mind. It would have been I had enough connections to be able to host him somewhere. Yeah. Whether it would have been back at De Montford or Birmingham University or another mosque somewhere or another organization somewhere. It wasn't as though he came with the branding of Al Maghrib Institute. Yeah, that was so a big organization. It's a big organization. People knew them. People knew the type of quality that their speakers would put out. So it wouldn't have been a case that I would have just been going in and saying, I've got this person that nobody knows and mm. can you give him a platform? It would have been easy enough to be able to get through that. Yeah. It was just the inconvenience of it. And it was just the almost the brother was trying to be so nice not to say no. But actually trying to be super helpful ended up being really unhelpful by just dropping at the last second. Um, so we would have so, it happen. So did he call you to say no or did he just call no, him? No, I phoned him. That's that's the one that threw me off. I was like, okay, you had to call him. And then I, like like a twist to a story, you just have to find out that way. It was, I always do a courtesy call Yeah. with a week to go to all the Islamic societies. So it wasn't any different. I'd called you know leads and the other places that we we're visiting yeah. around about the same time just to check in how things are going what time do you want us to be the house promotion going if i hadn't made that phone call and we'd rocked up to coventry university on the day <laughs> and there would have been nobody there or there would have been a different speaker doing a completely yeah. different thing that would have been awkward that would have been really bad planning from my part to not touch base with somebody yeah you know, as as an organizer that's another thing that's really important is making sure that you have all the information available to you at all times with all the different places. Sometimes you'll have a university where they've had problems with the SU or the person who greenlit the event, the president might have quit both the university and the Islamic society. So a new team is in and they want to do something different or a speaker request form has been rejected or rooms unavailable. There's a ton of different things that can happen. The Islamic society might have blown their entire budget on a food event before or just thought we're not getting much response or we want to cancel the entire thing so it's very important to always have an understanding of what's happening in all the different places that so, helps you that helps the speaker that helps yeah. the islamic site helps everyone just one person knowing what's happening everywhere do you always have like a contingent like a contingency plan that's might not be like solid or whatever but there's always at the back of your mind if this venue doesn't work out i have this venue like, do you have something like that in mind? Not necessarily. From what there are contingency plans for certain things. Yeah. But venues, no. Reason being, before I even invite the speaker. Yeah. And confirm flights, I would have touched base with the venue originally. Mm. So, like we were discussing last week, I go to the Islamic societies with the lectures, mm. the topics, and the speaker that is going to be delivering the speech because of course I don't want to invite as, as we discussed last week I don't want to invite somebody who everyone turns around and says we're not really interested in the speaker or yeah. we're not interested in the lectures so before I didn't even invited somebody I would have had the green light from the president it wouldn't be the case of I was speaking to the events manager or you know the head sister or the Juma Khutbah guy it would have been greenlit from the president yep we want to host this speaker on this date. So when you have that green light and you've got the assurance and everything that you essentially need to invite the speaker, you know, you would assume a act of God would stop you proceeding. You wouldn't yeah. assume that an Islamic society would just turn around and say no. So not really having a contingency for, okay. for But it seems that the the period where you had to switch it from what was it? Uh, Coventry. So, it's no, no Sunday or yes. The initial period that skewed the whole scheduling afterwards. So was that one of your first moments where you had to like, you know, rearrange some things very quickly and figure out how you're still going to work with your initial vision in mind? The only major change that impacted off of that yeah. was adding Green Lane. Okay. Because. We were in the process. Communication is always going on in, with multiple different individuals and parties yeah. at the same time. So you're speaking to the universities, trying to explain to them what you're trying to do, what topics you want to cover, which speaker you want to bring. The, the overall vibe takes them a few weeks 
to speak about it internally, get the paper signed, so on and so forth. We were trying to get venues, university venues for Thursday and Friday to take the this, this speaker there. As soon as we found out it had to be Sunday to Wednesday, we scrapped reaching out to people for Thursday and Friday. Mm. And all the universities that we were visiting or planning to visit, yeah. we just went back and said, oh, the topics changed for your particular university. Yeah. What had happened was every single other university was more pleased with the lecture title that they'd received subsequent to the change, aside from Warwick. Okay. So everybody else was, oh, well, the topic that you've given out is actually better than the one that you told us previously. So we're happy with it. The only ones who weren't were Warwick. Okay. So Green Lane was a new addition. To them, they were just like, okay, it's a nice topic. We'll do it. And everybody else was like, oh, this has worked out even better for us. It was just Warwick who were like, actually, we had a really good topic first time around, especially in line with this summer winners week. Mm. Now this one doesn't work as well. So okay. it happens. Exactly, it happens. Yeah. One of those things. And after this, uh, our journey takes us from the Midlands to the north, and the next event name, uh, which had well, which what was it called? Wealth before poverty. Wealth, yeah, wealth before poverty it was in Leeds University. Uh, tell us about that and how, because uh, you told us before that Leeds was a familiar place you've been to before, like yeah. media days. How was it coming back then? Uh, as a official big man with an organization and a sheikh to boot? Well, I'd already been there with a the sheikh, right? Yeah. So, so that wasn't too different. The interesting thing is, so I had gone there in 2006, mm. 2006 with Mufti Menk. And I was going back now in 2008. So the Mufti Menk event was November 2006. This was February 2008. So you're talking about a year and a half. But because it's a university, a year and a half, it essentially is two years because the committee has changed twice yeah, yeah. In, in two circle cycles. So the people that I was liaising with now had no recollection of the event two years ago or their third years now, that was in their first year. So they're far more into running out of university and graduating then organizing the Islamic Society stuff. Most of the organizing of events is normally the second years and the first years. Yeah. So to them, me going back was just like, oh, you've been here before. Like, yeah. It was news to them. They they had no idea. Because the previous one was done, you know, through another organization's banner, even though I'd organized and put the whole thing on, it was with somebody else. So I couldn't really turn around and say, oh, like media's been here before because it, it wasn't, necessarily true i was there but like media wasn't so that was um the interaction with them and that's always interesting you'll go to an islamic society and if you miss a year it's almost as if a couple of people remember you yeah and if you miss two years you'll walk back in and you know maybe one person remembers yeah. you and sometimes you'll go back after 10 years and the one guy will rock up and say, oh, do you remember me? I yeah. was here 10 years ago. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you from 10 years ago. What's going on? You're still at uni. Yeah, I'm still yeah. at uni. Yeah. Right. So sometimes you just go and people are like, you know, I've had even universities that I go to year on year sometimes. Yeah. And a guy will rock up and say, oh, um, I've not seen you before, brother. Mm. First time I'm seeing you. Oh, I came right here last year. Really? For what lecture? I, you know, we did, we did this lecture here. Did you not attend? Yeah, I was in the front row. Where were you? Hmm. And I'm like, dude, I did a presentation straight after the speaker. So unless you were not paying attention to like my 15 minutes yeah. thing, how could you not? Like I have a very distinctive face, yeah. right? <laughs> it's not like you look like every other brown person I've ever seen in my life. So um, it's always it's always weird and funny to to kind of see that. What was interesting though about this time going to Leeds as well, because it was an Al-Maghrib Institute speaker. Yeah. Al-Maghrib have regions and teams within their regions. Yeah. So the North team, they were also advertising it on the ground in Leeds. Mm. So when we rocked up already in the room, Al Maghri banners are up and they had leaflets around, which was, which was fine by me. You know, I wasn't really into it for the name anyway. So, and it was an Al Maghrib Institute speaker and, mm. and we had agreed that they'd be able to have publicity and stuff. So when we walked in, it was really easy for me because I just got on, took my tripod and my camera out. Sheikh Abdubari got on stage, did his thing. 
record it and you know a lot of the stuff was taken care of so sometimes when you work with islamic societies and external organizations together if there's three entities involved mm. sometimes it can go really well like the leads event it was really smooth really clear the al maghrib team were already speaking to the leads team saying you know speaker of hours and this is how we treat them and this is how we expect things to be rolled out so they were able to give them you know a helping hand a lead, lead leading hand mm. which made it easier for me sometimes and we'll come on this later on in one of the other events sometimes that hand can be really forbearing and really holds back um and makes things really awkward sometimes but in this instance that wasn't the case in leads it was really cool really smooth and i just remember from the lecture itself it was really cold in leads leads is cold anyway mm. i think it's one of those places where it's ab- so far up above sea level or i don't know mm. however that thing is calculated but it's always really cold in leads even in the lecture theater that we went to so if you watch the video check up the bari still wearing his jacket all the way through the 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 lecture and it's the only event where he's wearing his jacket because yeah. it was really cold in there and uh i just remember that from that particular event okay how did the lecture go how did the event go in terms of did was someone saved from the nightclub in that one <laughs> huh? well this is uh, wealth before poverty so all those people trying to make loads of money were probably there but mm. Do you remember when I spoke about Leeds uh, with the Mufti Menk event and there was yeah. nine people there yeah. right we had a bigger attendance this time oh, right? so okay, you know, okay. <laughs> we had 10 even no. <laughs> cold yeah i mean you know we had we had more people it's one of those things it's it's always difficult to estimate guesstimate how many people are going to turn up to mm. an event sometimes it's horrible weather and people just flock to the room sometimes it's horrible weather and people just stay away because it's horrible weather sometimes it's a big name speaker and people gravitate sometimes it's a big name speaker and people just don't bother turning up yeah um you can't put a finger on why more people turn up here there and everywhere that particular day there was a there was a big return there was a healthy crowd i would say about 50 60 odd people okay. for, uh, there and ironically discussing it with the isaac president afterwards when we went out to eat mm. he said oh because it's cold people came to the lecture theater to kind of get together stay in a warm space rather than walking around yeah. campus and on the streets they just thought well we're on campus we need to stay warm for a bit longer yeah. the only other place i'm going to go is back to my house who knows what the student accommodation heating situations like so they thought we'll come to the lecture room we'll just chill out there so yeah. certain times weather has an impact adversely this time it was a positive impact that's cool okay the last day of the event was held that in the best place possible as the university and my alma mater uh, in Birmingham and the event was called free time before preoccupation how did you find this event and and say only good things <laughs> first of all were you there no i wasn't were you at university then how uh, what year 2010 10 10 yeah no i came in 11 oh okay so we'll let you off right yeah. we'll let you off so Aston University was a really good solid dependable regularly well attended circle space. Mhm. Aston University at that time was one of the very few Islamic societies that were doing lectures every Wednesday yeah, at 2 p.m. Yeah. Lots of Islamic societies would do events and would do events on Wednesdays, but Aston University would every single week have an event consistently. Mm. They believed in consistent output so for us when we approached them and said we've got this idea to them it was really helpful and useful because mm. it just slotted in it it was one less event that they needed to think of and take care of and it was a regular thing anyway the difference was being rather than them hosting a speaker from Birmingham or from London they could put the accolade on that this is an international speaker so more people attend So that was the first thing. The second thing was I always had a bee in my bonnet with Aston University around they would always have a rotating banner behind the speaker's head. Oh uh, yeah. So they have a screen for the, for those who are listening and you could try to visualize it. So you've got a table mm. and the speaker would sit behind the table. Right behind the speaker is a big projector screen. 
and they would put on rotating images of oh, events yeah. coming in the future. Mm. So from a visual perspective, when you're trying to record this, it's horrible. Yeah, because it's just a bright... It's a bright color and it keeps changing, right? There's inconsistency in the color. That I can get over. You know, I'm not that much of a perfectionist, although it's not ideal. I know there's bigger pluses to be had out of it than, than that. The problem is when people's eye line moves from the speaker to what's behind his head. Which always happens. Because there's something always going on behind the speaker's head. So your eye line naturally just gravitates from him up to the sky. Mm. And credit to him, credit to a lot of Muslim scholars, they don't get distracted. When I do my presentation afterwards and I see people's you know eyes drifting to the screen behind me, it's very distracting. Yeah. Like it really put, like you almost feel as if you turn around and saying, What are you all looking at right now? <laughs> it's been on rotation yeah. for an hour. What's so interesting? Um, so that was something that after I did that event at Aston Uni, the next time I went into Aston Uni, grab the president. Don't put that thing on the screen behind. Don't have it rotating. And who was the president at the time? Uh, for this event. Yeah. His name was Hamid. Yeah, pharmacy guy. Uh, maybe very nice guy. Yeah, uh, partially deaf. I don't know, man. I was never that close yeah, to him. I'm not. So um, his surname was Ghazi. Sorry, Ghazi. His name was surname. I just know Hamid. Okay. Yeah. So a very nice guy. Uh, very smiley. Made things yes, happen. Yeah. Very polite. Um, was helpful. They're good in lots of there, lots of them. lots of ways. So the following year, when he wasn't president, I went to the next guy and said. Don't have a rotating banner behind the screen. Mm. And there was a few that were like, no, we do that for every single event. And I said, when you have that, it's very distracting. People just naturally look mm. at it. And I think then they started to get, oh, actually, that is true. I, I do it myself. I look at the screen behind and I'm like, yeah, after you've seen it 15 times, do I really mm. need to see it ro keep rotating in an hour's speech? So I remember that day, because it was the last day, we had two events back to back. And... I brought a friend with me who sat in the car. He wanted to, he knew Sheikh Abdubari before, mm. but because it was the last day and there was two events, he wanted to benefit from both lectures. So he thought rather than, you know, go to a day where there's only one, he said, look, can I jump in with you guys and go on the road um, and, and be with you guys for, for the last day? So that was good. So if any, as a takeaway, if any Islamic society, president or events organizer mm. who's listening to this and you have an event don't have a rotating banner don't. behind the speaker's head very distracting did they replace it with just a normal poster banner no so what happened was the following year when i went you know you have the touch screen that manages all of the displays yeah. i yeah. would just go and press off Okay. So I'm just taking my own hand, press yeah. off. And if I saw anyone try to go near it, I just give them that look yeah. like, where are you going? Where are you yeah. going? <laughs> so, because uh, uh, the, the thing is, as soon as he's finished, put it back on, yeah. put it on before he starts. It's just, as a speaker, I've done it when I have a five minute presentation. You mm. see my five minute presentation at the end, right? Five, mm. 10 minutes. And I'll try to keep it lighthearted. I'll try to keep it quick. But if people start talking, it puts you, because you can hear every single word. Yeah. And then when people are looking in different places, you naturally start looking there yourself mm. because if a door opens and everyone looks at the door, it's natural for then you to turn around and look mm. at the door. So every little thing that you don't see. So for example, when someone's yawning, mm. the speaker sees it and then the speaker will innately adapt to that. Yeah. Think, oh, they're getting bored. They're getting tired, restless. I'll, I better tell this really quickly so that they can, they can go. Whereas it might just be the case that someone's just really tired. So everything that you do as an audience member, don't forget that the speaker okay, yeah. sees that and reacts to that, even if it's subconsciously. So it's very... Um, it's just that body language thing. Like if you're telling a story and you see someone getting bored, you you rush to the end as quick as possible because you're like, okay, I don't want... They, I'm losing them. I'm losing them. I have to hurry up. I remember I did a presentation one time and I had gifts, loud noises and everything. And Chinese exchange students at the top just didn't pay attention to me. And I just looked at the screen. It's the loudest audio you can ever hear, but they would not get off their phone, collectively even. And I was like, how can I get their attention? And I had like ha more than half the room on my side, but I just looked at them. And I'm like, how can I get their attention? Because <laughs> I, I, I felt like I needed their validation in some way. But, you know, screw them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you're an organizer and you're putting on these things, 
unless it's related to the topic itself mm. and it's static or you know it's different if it's like an artist and a performer and it's visually aiding what they're saying if you invite a sheikh or a speaker or a scholar or a professor of any kind don't have something in the back that's rotating yeah just you know keep the distractions to a minimum because he him, the speaker speaking should be the main attraction yeah and the last event was uh you know the last topic life before death have you won at sheffield hallam university which i've never been to but i know a few people from there and you told me before that there was some controversy at this place let's talk about that first okay so sheffield hallam by the way after this event i'd never been there before mm. and after this event i've been to sheffield hallam probably the most after De Montford, Birmingham, okay. as in the university that I've in visited the most. Yeah. This was the very first time I'd liaised with them, just came across their Facebook page. They look like they're quite active. Mm. Never been to Sheffield before. Thought, let's try it out. Been to a lot of different places. Let's go to Sheffield. And, you know, earlier where I was mentioning working with an external organization, sometimes mm. it has an advantage. Sometimes it has a disadvantage. This was an instance where it was a disadvantage. I turned up to the university and the ASAC president was very upset. And he pulled me aside and said, do you have a problem with us having stalls at our event? I said, I don't have a problem with you having stalls at, you, at the event. It's your event just as much as it is my event. Yeah. You know, I'm your guest you want to have 75 stalls in your in your hall that's perfectly fine we ask for certain things and it's only fair that you can have whatever you want mm. he said because the other organization mm. there was a brother from al maghrib institute at the time yeah who was volunteering for al maghrib he wasn't like a head or something or whatever but he had gone in to the islamic society and said we're having a stall here today and you cannot have any other stalls by any other institutes or organizations or Islamic groups here at all. Mm. Because this is our event and we want the focus completely to be on us. And I knew that's not how Al Maghrib rolls. Mm. You know, it's clearly a rogue individual. Oh, yeah, that's always some over eager young guy who tries too much. But the Isaac president said that's fine. There were they have spoken to a, you know, a couple of bookstores and places yeah. and they said, look, we'll cancel them. But there's one brother here who sells other, you know, the, the perfumes. Mm. And he gave us a lump sum of money at the beginning of the year. And the only thing he asked in return is if he can come and sell his perfumes at each of our events. Mm. He's not even a direct competitor to, to you guys. He's just trying to do his Islamic ethos and service through this particular thing his intention was yeah. if people smell better you know he'll get reward for helping them noble they were like nope and he said i don't understand you've got your dawah your way this guy's doing his dawah his way why are you stopping this guy from doing his dawah it doesn't mm. make sense whether it's from you it's from him from a third person it's still dawah work we should not put barriers in front of that yeah and the guy was like no you either, and I think they got into it because I wasn't there for this entire conversation. So he's relaying, the ISOC president's relaying to me what happened. Mm. So he said, we went back and forth on this. And the, the volunteer for the other group said to him, fine, if you want this stall at your event, we will let you have this stall now. But don't ever expect a speaker from us in the future. Yo. He went with a hard negotiation tactics. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I, and, and so he's coming to me, like, very upset about this. Mm. And he's almost asking me, am I dictating these terms? Am I also in collusion with this idea that yeah. people can't have the stall and this other guy couldn't have a stall and this is how we do things, it's our event, so only we can do it. So I just told him very honestly and openly, I have, if it was up to me, yeah, and you guys wanted as many stalls as you want in there. That's your right. That's your entitled to that. You can have it. Mm. 
at the same time, I don't know what to tell you because he's told you that as far as I'm aware, there's not that problem. But And in every other university, nothing like that popped up. Nobody wanted a stall in another university. The only oh, other place okay. that there was a stall was in Leeds. So in Leeds, there was a stall. Okay. And it was an Ulmar group stall. So it was fine. But Leeds didn't have a thing where, you know, they wanted more stalls. So um, that was, so he, he just came to me and said, look, he was trying to ask me, mm. is this your logic and your way of thinking as well? And I just, you know, wash my hands of it. Nothing to do with me. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. That's not how I would assume things would have gone down. So Al Maghrib didn't inform you of any of these things? Because I don't think it's once things are delegated yeah. from a central down to a regional perspective, I think they just allow. And I don't even think it was the head of the region. No. I think it was from the the head. They found out who's the closest to the university who can make it. Yeah. And then that brother said, oh, I'm quite close. I'll go. And then in his over eagerness, he started laying down the law a little yeah. bit. Because I, I know if I went back to the head of Al Maghrib, if I went to Sheikh, Sheikh Abdubari, he would have been like, it's a other Fine, stall. Yeah. Like, it's not sure. a problem. It's, it doesn't affect us in any way. In fact, if people are smelling better, it's probably better for us, right? Mm. You know, get some fresh smelling brothers in that room sometimes, right? So, um, yeah, it just, so, and he was really happy afterwards. You know, when I spoke to him, he said, look, you've put me at ease. You know, to be honest with you, after this went down, because I thought it was like media driven Mm. thing in conjunction with them i was gonna you know blacklist you guys and say look this is how you guys operate <laughs> yeah and i don't want anything to you but i can t he knew that i was being 100 percent honest yeah. and and truthful with him and he said look i'm pleased that you said that and i'm pleased that you said that if the shoe was on the other foot you guys wouldn't have had an issue with it and that's where the beginning of that relationship with um sheffield hallam really started and we mm. did a lot of good stuff with them over the years yeah but because we did two events mm. in the day again just like with all the other speakers that we've told with before we've been on the road with Sheikh Abdubari for for many days mm. we were based in Birmingham and each day we were traveling to different places so you imagine okay Green Lane is in Birmingham and Warwick was only in Coventry which is half an hour away but Leeds was you know three hours one way three hours back so that's we're talking already we'd spent seven eight hours together and yeah. then the next day was um, Aston and uh, Sheffield. So we'd probably spent like 10 hours on the road together. Yeah. And obviously you get comfortable with each other. You, and he started advising me. He said, look, because I'd always tell the story of how like media was created. Mm. You know, the idea behind the name. And he said, you should make it somewhat funny. So you should do a interactive thing where people laugh at, you know, your, your, the name. So I went on the stage, this was after the event, I went on the stage and I said, we're called likemedia.tv because we like to make media that inspires Muslims and helps them learn. And we called it .tv and I have a massive pause and I said, because .com was taken and everyone in the room <laughs> just cracked up because they were expecting like some big, yeah. you know, philosophical answer yeah. to why we called it .tv. And I was like, we called it .tv because dot com yeah. was taken and everyone like Sheikh, the the president, the entire room, you just heard raucous crowd. I mean, the crowd was, Hallam was also one of the reasons why we went back was it was a very, very good crowd. I think it was the best attended one out of all mm -hmm. the lectures that we went to, which is always nice. You know, in the, in the last tour, it was nice when we went to Birmingham City University and had a relatively smallish crowd. It allowed us to slowly end the tour. Mm. But this one was different because it was a packed house full of energy full of positivity and everyone you feed off that as well. So you yeah, feed off different high, vibes. Yeah. yeah. So it was really good. It was a really well attended crowd. And one of the other things that I remember from this particular lecture was mm. Sheikh Abdubari shared the story of his father being shot outside of the masjid and Sheikh Abdubari finding his father after he'd been shot. Oh, subhanAllah. Yeah. So he did it in a way. So he's, you know, he would tell he would tell me on on the road that in America, when you go to a university mm. and you deliver an Islamic lecture, the attendees are very interactive. So when you do like a real 
deep point they'll be like yeah, yeah you know really yeah, getting into yeah, it that american way that bravado yeah. that bravado <laughs> so he was he was telling me you know when i stand there and i make a really good point yeah people stand there and go yeah that's what's up yeah right and he goes here nobody says anything no he goes i crack a joke nobody laughs yeah. i tell a story that's really deep nobody does anything so Hallam was a bit different because it was a bigger crowd mm. People were laughing at his jokes so yeah. he really he really enjoyed it because he said it felt if you watch the video back you'll see he you know we mic'd him up really well so you can't yeah. hear the crowd laughing as much but you can um, you can see him like cracking a few jokes it was because they were being receptive but then he told this story about his because it was lots of humor and, and he told it in a very funny way he told the story of his father being shot and he slowed his voice down mm. and told it really dramatically mm. and told how the officer came and he told the officer like i'm not upset because my dad the last thing he said before he died was the shahada subhanallah and i told him don't say anything so although i'm i'm upset that he died i'm pleased that he got to die with the words that i don't know if i'll ever be able to do that mm. and it was pin drop silence in the room pin drop silence and there was people crying in the mm. room and like not bawling but you know really because the way we've taken that clip out if you ever go to the like media youtube channel mm. it's about a three and a half four minute clip and it says my father was murdered outside the masjid by sheikh abdul bari yahya and I mean that clip that we recorded has been taken and put on to other YouTube channels you know when they put in the dramatic music mm. and they've got images of like the waves and all that yeah. kind of stuff and it's got millions of views um through through those portals which is all good you know I've always said to a lot of speakers that if anyone takes my work puts it in a place yeah. where it reaches far more people a lot of people might be jealous of that kind of stuff I'm like on the day of judgment when god's handing out the good deeds my hands going up in the back yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah like god yo i he did that right it's like i want ball. my i yeah. want my thing yeah. I, i want my deeds man like <coughs> they they just took it and played it right i yeah. want my share of the good deeds right so i'm i'm never uh, upset about that kind of stuff but yeah we've got the clip online and i just remember when people were just th- that story and we shared it online and loads of people especially people who'd been to al maghrib classes before and mm. had heard that story mm. shared that video it went mini viral for for a few few days because even the clip even though we mic'd him up so that you can only really hear him and you can't really hear the crowd you can hear the emotion you can feel the emotion in the mm. room through the video and the way that he says it it's a very very powerful um extract from yeah. that lecture so that lecture Not only was the crowd great, not only was that story awesome, but the entire lecture was probably the perfect lecture in terms of the way it was structured, the interaction from the audience, and to end the tour on that note mm. was really really good. That's good. And people, you know, it just again, if you remember before in previous podcasts we've talked about how the different stages of emotions you feel when you're putting on a tour. Mm. and sometimes you're like why am i doing this and sometimes you're like oh i want this again yeah i want to do this again i want to feel the high and and that was one of those moments where i felt you know i want to um feel that high and that's why i felt validated in recording content and mm. sharing it online because i can explain that to you mm. but you could also watch it yourself yeah. and feel it yourself yeah. and if i'm telling you i can only tell you and people have interacted with but online it can exponentially reach so many other people mm. and they can feel that vibe and exactly it was recorded in sheffield delivered by an american vietnamese sheikh yeah organized by a kid from birmingham and people in canada and the netherlands and pakistan egypt and south africa and australia are watching this video clip they wouldn't be able to hear that yeah if it was just with the people in the room so that felt like a validation of yeah you know we've recorded This media work has has some benefit okay exactly i i wonder like do you feel the same 
you know, emotions, like whenever you go to the venue and you listen to the lecture, is it the same for you as, as it is for the audience? Because you've heard the Sheikh uh, speak through many other venues. Do you feel more invigorated when he gives the lecture to the audience and you feel as part of the audience? Or do you feel more invigorated in the journeys when you have the more closer one-to-ones? Like which, where do you benefit from the Sheikh's wisdom the most? In both places, to be honest with you, a lot of the times, from a purely selfish point of view, when yeah. I'm putting together topics and titles, mm. not necessarily this one, but in future ones, I have put together subject matters that I myself want to learn about. Yeah. Okay. So I have put on discussions where people are like, this is a bit left field, this mm. is a bit different. And I think to myself, well, if I'm the average Muslim and I'm targeting myself, and I haven't heard this story, and yeah. I would benefit, and I would enjoy listening to this story, but I'm sure other people would. So from a purely selfish perspective, I have done that in the past. And I pay attention to you know all the lectures that I, I attend to, and I really get into it. Like we discussed in the first podcast, mm. I was inspired by a lecture, right? So yeah. I'm always trying to get things from that perspective. But again, when you're on the road and you're discussing, you're mm. discussing different things. We're not discussing the stuff that is in the lecture. A lot of the times the lecture stuff is theological discussions. Yeah. They're not necessarily practical discussions. They're discussions to aid your understanding of the faith. Mm. A lot of times when you're in the car and you're discussing stuff, it's far more practical, it's far more personal, it's yeah. far more tailored to you as an individual and the circumstances and stuff like that. So I enjoy both, I benefit from both, okay. but they both have a different um Never. Which which one sticks with you the most? Now the event's finished, you go home. Which one impacts your life the most? The personal stuff, yeah. when we discuss it on the road, over the course of five, six days, there's probably only one thing that really affects you. Mm. There's one practical piece of advice that you can take away. Because you can't also... It's, it's not natural to open up your entire life to someone that you've just met yeah. and expect them to answer every single question, without right? Doubt, without doubt. So you would really just ask them about one or two things that really would benefit you practically. Yeah. The lectures, like before we did the podcast, mm. we're talking about stuff from nine, eight, nine years ago. And I'm still able to recall major things from each individual, not just tour, but each individual event. Mm. I have a good memory, right? That's first and foremost. But at the same time, these things were paramount and important and impactful that I've been able to remember them all yeah, these years exactly. on. Whereas, you know, if you were to ask me, what did you discuss with Sheikh Abdubari on the way? Well, I remember the him saying, make like media funny, that part. Mm. I don't remember very much else. Maybe snippets here and there and, you know, brief memories of we were on this road and we did this, but I don't remember discussions. Whereas I remember... And most of these lectures, I mean, I haven't watched the entire lecture back. Mm. I can still recall major, major parts of it. So I would say the lecture stuff I remember more of. Mm. Okay. But the personal stuff, you take one or two away and you would definitely implement them in your life, if yeah. that makes sense. Okay. And it's interesting that you say uh, how Americans find it hard to interact with British audiences because I've I've been with you where you've brought in some American, uh, you know, speakers, artists and all type of stuff. And they have the same problem. We're just not that engageable. We can't because British people want to be enjoy, like entertained in their own time. We don't like to be forced. It's like, don't tell me to clap. I'll clap in my own time. I will laugh in my own time. And I won't do a whole big show about it. Like Americans will make a very clear statement of if they enjoy something or not. While British people can be quiet and still think to themselves, it's the best event they've ever, they've ever been to. Yeah, I've had speakers who in the past have said, I don't think anyone was paying attention to the entire thing. Mm. Because people just didn't respond, didn't engage. And then a guy would just walk up to them afterwards and relate the entire lecture back mm. i really liked it when you said this and you said this and that was really good and mm. how come you didn't discuss this and you know that part there what did you mean there and they're dumbstruck like this dude was sat in the front row and had a glazed look on his eye <laughs> throughout the entire thing yeah 
And I thought nobody was listening, nobody's interacting. But you have to understand with the UK audience, their way of acknowledging, showing respect is mm. to absorb the information. Exactly. Rather than respond to everything. So their way of saying, yeah, I really appreciate it is to sit there attentively and respectfully. Mm. You know, I think it's a, this is sometimes where people are always like, are you British? Are you Muslim? Yeah. I think it's a very British thing that Muslims do. Emulating that whole, we're going to be respectful and yeah. honorable and we're going to sit here and we're going to show you afterwards that we were paying attention, but we're not going to interrupt in any way. It's a very British thing to do that. And it's very interesting that how as an audience universally it happens, like we're talking going back 10 years, still right now, we will have an event where the audience will be quiet throughout the entire thing. Yeah. It's changing a little bit now because people now expect speakers to crack jokes and interact with them and on, on that level and social media and you know art and performance has meant that people expect audiences to interact a little bit more but generally speaking if you still had an elder scholar going to a university yeah you're still going to have that very respectful attentive you know even at the end you'll have some places that won't clap won't show appreciation they'll just be like that was really good yeah and that's it, you know, that that was lost, it yeah, that subtle appreciation. Because I, I, even coming from Sweden and they are also very subdued as an audience and here they're also subdued. And now I have this perspective where if someone's allowed at an event and I feel that I look at them as obnoxious and I'm like, I'm the civilized person. I'm just <laughs> going to sit here calmly taking what's, what's being said and, and, you know, that's that. I mean, on that note, I remember... Buna went to a Buna Muhammad. Yeah. He I took him to an event where he was in the crowd mm. to a spoken word poetry event. So he's a spoken word poet himself. Mm. I took him to an event and the he was responding loudly yeah. to a poet who was on the stage. Yeah. When the poet was saying something really good, Buna was like, oh dope, you know, really <laughs> giving that interaction, right? Yeah. And then the crowd fed off of that. Because they were like, oh, maybe that's what we're supposed to do. Maybe oh, okay, we're supposed yeah. to, you know, react like that. Because yeah. he was doing it not to, you know, have a go at the guy. He was doing it to say, this is how we show love and appreciation out out, out there. So uh, afterwards, I spoke to him about it. And he said, yeah, that's what that's what happens at this point. Why do you guys not interact at all? So um, it's just interesting, that whole cultural shift, mm. despite the fact that, you know, Americans are very similar to, to Brits. But, you know, culturally, we eat the same food for, for vast majority, watch the same things on TV, yeah. just interact very differently. Okay. Uh, the difference between this tour and your first tour is that you didn't go to the same universities. They were different to that. And there weren't any repeat visits. Uh, was, there a, was there a conscious choice for that? Did you do this on purpose? Yes, in a nutshell. So... When I was a university student myself, yeah. it was a running joke that certain organizations that were putting on national events, mm. because there were organizations who were putting on events, but singular events, nobody was, sorry, not nobody. There was a select few who were doing national events. And when it came to a national thing, those organizations would have favorites. They would visit the same spots over and over and over again. Yeah whether it was a big city, whether it was a loyal city, yeah. whether it was a organization where they had friends and representatives who they felt represented the same views as them. It was always a running joke that organizations, whenever they have a national thing, it would always go to the same places. I wanted to move away from that. I didn't want there to be a thought process in my mind that I'll always go back to Birmingham mm. or I'll always go back to De Montford or Manchester or Leeds or wherever it might be. I'm not going to go back to these places just because it's the easy uh, thing to do. Yeah. So I intentionally ensure that the second tour, I visited different spaces yeah. and different places. And I wanted to do that as well because we're completely new. It doesn't make sense to restrict our um, restrict our reach by just going to the same places again, seeing the same faces. So, yes, I wanted to not repeat, but primarily it was 
for the same thing that we spoke about earlier to gain mm. more rewards reaching more people okay, yeah. gaining more rewards because if we keep speaking to the same people over and over again number one they're not going to hear the message that we yeah. deliver that one but number two in the future if we want to do something they're not going to they won't know us they won't have any understanding of who we are what we're trying to do what we're mm. about so it makes sense to you know kind of spread your wings a little bit so that everyone gets to know the organization and what benefits it can bring and then if everyone benefits yeah you know so if Tomorrow, let's take the Coventry and Warwick situation. If tomorrow I went to an Islamic society and the same thing happened, yeah, and I've only built up a network of five Islamic societies, I'm kind of in a in a bit of a situation right mm-hmm. there because, well, four of the other places that I'm friendly with are already booked up, so I have to go find someone who doesn't know me, doesn't know my organization, doesn't know what we're trying to do, and that's a you know logistical nightmare right there. And also, how many times are, you know, if I do a lecture every week at Birmingham University, yeah, how many people is that going to be novel to? How many people is yeah. that going to be unique to? Like, oh, there's another international guy that he's bringing, or there's another speaker he's bringing. Whereas to somebody else, just like that Birmingham City University example, mm. the reason why Sheffield Hallam had the biggest attendance was at that time, they weren't really getting loads and loads of international speakers. Whereas another place probably were, so it wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah. So again, with that philosophy and thought process of, I want to help everyone. I want to build strong Islamic societies everywhere, not just in the main places, not just in the main cities, not just where I was comfortable with. I want to do a service to everyone. Mm. So for that reason, I intentionally ensured that I didn't go. Again, these are all messages that in my mind were playing. Uh, you know, when we discussed earlier in in the podcast about. I wanted to call it five before the number five mm. because it was like the shorthand version, the wrong version. And this idea of having a more a speaker that was more in the Salafi circles than in the Sufi circles, yeah. because I didn't want anyone to pigeonhole me into a certain thing. These are things that go in your mind as an, as an organizer yeah. that if you went out to most people, they wouldn't even recollect that or it wouldn't even cross their mind. So this idea that, I wanted to go to five different places so nobody could say, oh, he goes to the same places. In my mind, that was really, really important. Yeah. To somebody else, it was like, okay, I just thought he'd, you know, these were the Islamic societies that picked it up. So that happens sometimes when you, you know, you think so much about things and you try to create something. And it's always for the people. Like, what's the maximum amount of people that can benefit from what I'm doing? And, and, and that's a noble goal to start from. And I think that's all uh, for this episode um, of the Traveller's Prayer. The next episode, next week, we have a big episode, a huge episode called The Stranger's Tour with uh, Baba Ali and Buna Muhammad, which you just mentioned, and Sheikh Amr Jamil, which I'm sure there's a lot of stories there and memories from that tour. Am I right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Okay, so am I. Uh, so be sure to listen in. And yeah, that's all, folks. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Keep the faith.